and welcome to Qubits Education. In this lesson, we are going to go through fictional writing for GCSE English. More specifically, questions five and six on paper one, uh, section B of the Edexcel um, specification. Okay, so in this lesson, our objectives are to understand what you need to do to answer the questions on fictional writing on paper one, fiction and imaginative, imaginative writing, and learn some tips for answering these questions effectively. Look at example questions and answers as well as the mark scheme and assessment grids to give you a really clear understanding of what it is you've got to do. Okay, so question five or six. So section B is an imaginative writing piece and it says to answer one question. You should spend about 45 minutes on this section. Write your answer in the space provided. So I've got two questions here. We're going to go through them in a moment. We don't need to read them just yet, but I'm just going to go through what it is you've got to do for this section. So first of all, as it says just there, you're only going to choose one of these. You're not going to write both. They are 40 marks each. OK, so you will not be expected to write both answers in the 45 minutes that you've got. So just choose one. Um, this is worth 25% of your mark, so it's a quarter of the paper. So you need to make sure that you do quite well. And the reading section of paper one isn't quite as taxing, so you'll have plenty of time to complete this section once you actually get there. Okay, so 25% of your marks this is worth, so you want to be able to spend a good amount of time on it. Now... When you look at question uh, five and six, there are images provided for you to give you ideas, but you don't actually have to use them if you don't want to, all right? Um, you could also use them to start off your, your answer, but you don't have to continue your answer about that the entire way through. It can change, and you don't have to use them at all. Your responses can be real or imagined, so... You know, you could write about something that actually happened to you if you like, but sometimes an imagined answer gives you a really good response and it keeps the reader really interested in what you're saying. And it can be loosely based on the question. You can expand on it. So, for example, if we look at question five here, it says to write about a time when you or someone you know did something that they should not have done. Your response could be real or imagined, your response will be marked for the accurate and appropriate use of vocabulary, spelling, punctuation and grammar. So here, again, it can be loosely based on the question. You know, yes, it's got to be some, uh, sorry, it's got to be uh, something that they shouldn't have done, but it doesn't have to be you necessarily. It doesn't have to be someone you know in real life. It can be a completely imagined story. So you can make up a complete story, okay? Question six says, look at the images provided. Again, you don't have to use those. Write about a secret. Okay, your response could be real or imagined and you may wish to base your response on one of the images. You may wish to, uh, to, to base your response, meaning you don't have to do that. Again, it says that your response will be marked for the accurate and appropriate use of vocabulary, spelling, punctuation and grammar. Okay. Write about a secret. Well, that's very um, such a large um, target for you to accomplish that you could write about absolutely anything, which is really nice because it gives you the chance to decide. OK, and the examiner is mainly looking for good writing. So again, it can be loosely based on these questions. So all you've got to do for this one is write about a secret and all you've got to do for this one is write about something that someone shouldn't have done. OK, you've got to do that part. But again, it doesn't have to be based on the pictures and you can expand on that quite a lot. OK, so here's a few tips then to uh, to get you started. When you're writing your response or your story or your narrative, this could also be a monologue, meaning like a single piece of writing or reflective account. OK, think about the five senses. Think about sight, sound, smell, feel and taste. Okay, feel can be physical touch as well as emotions. And get quite a lot of these in throughout your piece of writing. It will really help with 
the language part of your marks. Okay, and you'll see what I mean in a moment when I go through what you get for language and what you get for structure in terms of marks. Um, I'm also going to show you some example answers on what the uh, examiner reports have said. So another idea is to show, don't tell. So rather than saying something like, she was worrying, you could say, she had a churning feeling in the pit of her stomach, which only got worse when she thought about what she was going to do. Okay, so you haven't actually said she's worrying in that sentence, but it's obvious that she's worrying. This is also called inference, which uh, there will be a video on that as well. Use adjectives, so describe your nouns. Don't just say the tree, say the large hanging tree towered over me with its shower of branches and leaves, okay? Now, that's quite a descriptive, um, I've really described the noun there. It doesn't have to be quite so detailed, but it, again, it's a very good example of how you'll be awarded more marks. You can use metaphors and similes as well as extended metaphors throughout the, the piece. So you could use a metaphor within one sentence or a simile within one sentence. But sometimes um, it's a really good way to structure your answer by using an extended metaphor all the way through. So for example, um, one piece of writing that I'm going to show you in a moment uses the sea, um, personifies the sea, makes the sea into a person, describes the sea using traits that a person would have. And that's happen that happens throughout the, the text. So that's an extended metaphor. Okay, this is another example of a bit of an extended metaphor. The thunderous roar of the ceiling's collapse was loud enough to wake the dead. In a moment's time, I learned Claire knew how to drive, and I mean really drive. The flames nipped at our rear bumper, but not even those lightning bolts could catch us now. So we've used thunderous and lightning bolts there to, sorry, not myself, I found this, uh, this example, um, to show a bit of an extended metaphor using, you know, thunder and lightning in the weather. Okay. Use language features. Now, I know you must be learning about these at school or at college or in your private classes, depending on if you're doing this this. Uh, GCSE online, on, like an online course or whatever, I'm sure you've been learning about language features. There will be, um, again, some more videos on that. I think there are already a couple on my YouTube channel. So, for example, you could use alliteration, the rule of three, you know, lots of rhetorical questions, things like that. Don't overdo it, but show the examiner that you know how to use these and how to manipulate language. Now, in order to help you in the long run, due to the fact that it's it's quite early on now, it, we're almost heading into summer. So if you're starting your course in September, you could start the summer by reading quite a few novels. This will really help you in the long run. Because if you read a lot of novels, it will um, help you to um, to write better. OK, so just enjoy the novels. Think about as you're reading them. Oh, that's an interesting use of language or structure. Is there a flashback in there? Um, have they used an extended metaphor? What kind of language have they used? I would say Dan Brown is quite good for using flashbacks and flash forwards. He does that a lot uh, in his writing. So Dan Brown's quite good. Um, who else could I recommend? I mean, even, <laughs> even Stephen King, because he writes about lots of different things and he's a very well-established writer. And you'll probably like some of his books. If you want to read something really interesting, I would try Misery. Um, you might not be into his more... Um, i trying to think what you would call it. But, you know, like The Shining and things like that. You might not be into those. But if you are, then go ahead, try reading those. Um, look at those authors. I'm also in the middle of a new book by somebody called B.A. Paris. And it's called The Therapist. That's written in the first person, I think. I can't remember. But that might be a good one as well because it's uh, it's quite new. So, yeah, there's some good books for you to start on over the summer <laughs> if you want to. Okay, uh, finally, uh, take some ideas from the texts you've read earlier on. So in the paper, you've got some texts already. You can take some ideas from vocab or a scene that they've used. Obviously, don't steal that scene or plagiarise it, but you can just use some ideas and think, huh, 
they started it writing like this, maybe I could do that in my piece of writing. Okay, and it's also good to kind of have an idea of how you want to write or what you want to write about before you go into the exam. And then when you do get the question, you can kind of loosely base your answer on that. And usually the best responses are ones that have been planned beforehand. Okay, so um, just to have, have, a, have a go at planning something before you go into the exam as well. Okay, so let's look at what you're going to get your marks for. So you're going to get your marks for structure and you get about 24 marks for this. Okay, and then you'll get some marks for like spelling, punctuation and grammar as well. So structure is between 20 and 24 marks. Okay, so you need to show the examiner that you've structured your writing in some way. Okay, so like I say, do some planning beforehand um, or even plan whilst you're in there. If you've got an extra five minutes, if you've finished the first part of the paper early. So as I've already mentioned, you could use an extended metaphor throughout the text, showing that you have structured it in some way. So the example I mentioned earlier was a student had used uh, the C throughout his writing or her writing. I'm not sure who the student was, uh, but he had personified the C throughout. So explaining that the... Um, the sea had a hand over his mouth when the water, when his mouth filled with water and things like that. I'm going to show you that example. Again, the more you read, the more you will understand the extended metaphors. You could do a flashback or a flash forward. So you could start at one scene and then you could go back in time and explain what happened building up to that scene. You could do a flash forward where it goes into the future. Again, this can be real or imagined. Um, you could have a twist at the end. So yes, you could start, you could have a beginning, a middle and an end, which is fine. But you could then at the end have a twist. So you need to know what that twist is going to be and what you're going to reveal to the reader throughout the text before that twist. So you want to be able to choose wisely what it is you're going to reveal throughout before the twist at the end so you don't ruin it. You could write from a completely different perspective. So you don't, you might not want to be a person. You might want to be an animal or a building or another object. I think someone did mention that um, somebody was a fish in a bowl or, you know, a building is quite a nice one because you wouldn't even think that it was a building depending on how you write. Okay, so this, this building could be watching people coming in and out. You know, what jobs they do, who they are. And then at the end, you can reveal that it's a building. Obviously, I wouldn't recommend that one now, um, but choose your own. Just giving you as an example. So return to the beginning in some way at the end. So like I said, if you did a flashback, you could then go back to the beginning at the end where he's, he's back at that original scene. Uh, and you could use the image that you used at the beginning at the end as well. So if you did choose to use one of those images, um, you could then come back to that image at the end. So good use of imagery. Okay, so, uh, sorry, 24 marks there for structure. And then for the last 16 marks, it's all about spelling, punctuation and grammar. So you need to use correct spelling, punctuation and grammar throughout your text or as much as possible. And I would try to use these types of um, punctuation marks. So you could try and ask a question in there or use an exclamation, maybe, you know, you're scared, something loud happened, or you're shocked, or your character is shocked. Um, obviously, try and use speech, because that's always quite nice. And you could, you could use an ellipsis if possible, so that's your little three dots there, where you might say something like, um, you might show a statement, and then put three dots, and then maybe it's a bit of speech or maybe it's something that you know it's to build tension you've not quite revealed that part yet so you use the three dots and then reveal it okay uh, make sure you use commas and full stops in the right place okay check them at the end you can use semicolons to expand on sentences all right if it's a um if it's quite a long sentence or colons to show a list or to say that something is going to follow relating to what you've just said or to introduce, introduce a quote, all right? You can use some va fancy vocabulary. Now, if you use some fancy vocabulary, you'll score more marks, even if you spell it wrong, okay? But if you use your normal vocabulary, you need to spell it right, otherwise you will lose marks, okay? 
So let's say you've tried to use the word um, apothecary. <laughs> you and you spelt it wrong. All right, you still get some marks for that because it's a, a word that's not been used very often. It isn't used often. Whereas if you use the words two, two and two or there, there and there, you must spell them correctly because you'll lose marks for that. And make sure you've done your paragraphs. You can mark these at the end with this symbol here if you forget to do the paragraphs throughout. And sometimes when you are you know, really getting into your writing and what you're doing, you might forget to put the paragraphs in there, but just make sure you put them in at the end. And check that you've used capital letters for names and the beginning of sentences. Okay. All right, so let's have a look at the exam questions in more detail then and show you some examples. So as I've already mentioned, you only answer one of these. So question five is saying that you can, you need to write about a time when you or someone you know did something that they should not have done. Okay, so again, it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be someone you know. All right. So it doesn't have to be you or a real person. It can be written in the first or third person and can be completely made up. Use your imagination. Okay. Question six asks you to look at the uh, look at the images, but you don't have to use them. And it asks you to write about a secret. Okay. When using the images, try to write something completely different to what you think everyone else will write about. So if you do use the images, then, you know, try not to think, okay. Sorry, try and think, okay, everyone is going to write about this because that's what the image is presenting. So I need to think of something completely different, okay? Or just use it to spark your imagination and then let it run away with you a little, okay? So this will stop the examiner from getting bored. If they're writing a million stories about their first day of school, okay, or whatever, then obviously they're going to get bored. And you want to keep them as engaged as possible so that you get as many marks as possible. And that's why structure is also important, okay? You want to make sure you've got some kind of plan. You could write from a different perspective, as mentioned earlier. So to write about a secret, you could be a spy. You could have robbed a bank, okay? You could have murdered somebody, all right? Anything, you're writing about a secret. It can be completely made up, all right? Write about something that you should, uh, something that you should not have done, okay? Again, that could be a murder, Okay, again, you could have robbed a bank. Again, any of those, something that you should not have done. Okay, there's lots of things that you should not have done in life. Use one. Don't try to write a whole book. Write a very detailed scene. Write a lot about a small thing that happened, okay? If you try and write an entire story, you will, you will run out of time. You won't have enough time to do and the entire thing that you want to do and you definitely won't have time to put in language techniques and introduce a decent structure. Okay, so think about a detailed scene and write a lot about that small thing. I'm going to show you some examples. <laughs> okay, let's go. So, questions again. If you'd like to pause the video and um, read those questions in more detail, just again, just to make sure you know what they are. And you can even have a go at one or both because you're revising, remember, you can do both. And then I'm going to go through, through some examples and show you exactly what, you know, people have scored marks for, okay? So pause the video, have a go if you like and press play for some examples. Okay, so before we answer the questions, let's just quickly have a look at the mark scheme. So for question five, now don't panic about this. I don't want you to think that this means that what you've done might be wrong. Because once I show you some examples, you'll think, oh yeah, I have done that. Okay, so this may seem a little bit complicated. Um, but the purpose would have been for question five to write about something that you or someone shouldn't have done. Okay, which is fine. You know, you could include descriptions. Let me change my colour pen because I hate that colour. Um, anecdotes, speech, narrative and literary techniques, which we've already discussed. So I'm hoping that if you have had a go, then you would have put those in there. Your audience is a general readership. But if you did choose to write for a younger audience, someone that might have been your age, if you are doing this in school, 
or again an older audience if you are older and doing this as an online course then that's absolutely fine you can use language that might appeal to that audience okay so the form of this would have been like a narrative or a descriptive or monologue so a story or a reflective account okay that could have been real or imagined you must have had some clear organization organization and structure which we have already discussed so you should know that this is the case anyway it says here that some candidates may intentionally adapt their language and style to their audience by using, for example, a more informal or colloquial approach. That means using language that might be known to a younger generation, if it is younger that you're doing, you know, if you are younger, or language that is maybe of like an older generation, depending on what it is that you're trying to put across. Okay, and you may introduce some literary elements. Well, I'm hoping that you do anyway, as that is one of our main things that we've discussed previously. So, responses may choose to use the moment of doing something that um, that they should not have done, obviously, possibly allowing the writer to reveal something about themselves and to reflect upon his or her own life. So, that could have been a reflection if you'd written it like that. Again, this is your choice. It says responses may have chosen to do this, okay? And again, it could have been real or imagined, you could have written about other people involved. So even though I said to write a, a lot about one thing, like a scene, there could have been other characters. Um, one student that you'll see in a moment did three separate sections of three different times, but it was all very, um, it was quite well structured and um, they, they wrote about one section, this happened here, and then it, it moved on very quickly and then he's in another place and then he's in another place. But it still worked very well because there was structure, okay, and there were literary devices, etc. Okay, write about more than a single event. So that's that one, I've just mentioned that. Use appropriate techniques for creative writing. Again, we've mentioned this, vocabulary, imagery, language techniques, okay. Imagery, you know, describing really well what's happened using really good language and vocabulary. Use a voice that attempts to make the piece interesting and believable. So even if it is completely made up and it could be set in space, you know, at least try and make it believable. One thing that I do hate is when I'm watching a film, <laughs> even if it's like Predator or The Terminator, it, for me, it has to be believable. Even though it's set in the future or even though it's an alien, I need it to be believable to me. And you want to do that as well. It keeps the reader engaged, you know. If there's a fault in terms of the timeline... Uh, when you're talking about going into the future, that just bothers me. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm sure it won't um, affect your marks too much if there is a little error like that, but I'm just saying. Uh, demonstrate particular understanding of the form used, okay, and be written in a register and style appropriate for the chosen form, which may include colloquial elements, like I mentioned, language depending on your age, dialogue within the description or the narrative, so any speech that's in there, or a sustained single voice in a monologue. So that could be your 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 reflective account, okay? Again, it's up to you how you do this. As long as you include all those things that I mentioned on the previous slides, then you'll be absolutely fine. Question six, again, it will say very similar things because you're being asked to only do one of these. This question was obviously about a secret, and it might involve a range of approaches, including description, anecdote, speech, narrative, and literary techniques. So that's exactly the same, okay? Your audience is, again, exactly the same, general, and candidates choose to write for an adult audience or an audience of young people. It's your choice, okay? And your choice may then determine what kind of language you use and the kind of structure that you're going to use. So, for example, if you read... Um, uh, Big Little Lies by Leanne Moriarty. Again, another another good choice if you're reading over the summer. I'm sure it's Leanne. Um, then you will, not necessarily a twist, but there is a nice kind of a twist at the end. You know, or The Girl on the Train. Um, I can't remember the author. But she, you know, there was a twist at the end. Even though I say twists, I always find that I, uh, that, uh, that they're... 
not as twisty as I would like. Sometimes it's nice to have a really big twist and you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. So if you want to write something like that, that's really nice, really good structure there when you have a twist or a flashback, flash forward and so on. Okay, again, your form would be exactly the same. You need organisation and structure and um, you could, you might use, you know, colloquial language. All right, and definitely use literary elements. Colloquial language could be used in speech. So, like, for example, if you are uh, in Essex, there might be a type of speech that they use there, you know, their their, their accent, um, or words that they would use are different to words that we might use um, over here in Leicestershire. <laughs> okay, there you go, a little bit of an idea of where I am. Um, so, it just depends on how you're going to write it and who's talking within your your story, your narrative, or your monologue. Your monologue would be yourself, obviously. Well, not necessarily yourself, but a character you are going to be taking on as you write, because it would technically be written in the first person. Okay, again, responses may include include, uh, using the images to inspire writing if you want to. For example, some may choose to write about childhood secrets and bonding with others over a secret shared. For others, it may be a guilty secret. So as I mentioned, it could be that you've committed a murder. Here's me. You obviously know what kind of books I like. Um, you could have committed murder. You could have robbed a bank, okay, a bank robbery. Um, anything like that. Just try and use your imagination. A secret could also be something like um, you know, um, a fantasy t- type of secret, you know, something that you want to do in the future that you don't tell anyone, or, you know, you might want to, um, apply to be an astronaut and you don't want to tell anyone about that because you're scared that they'll make fun of you. Okay. So anything like that, uh, write about having a secret or sharing someone else's secret. Okay. So it doesn't have to be your secret. It could be someone's told you a secret to keep, you know, you could be having an affair, <laughs> depending on who you are and how old you are. Use any example of a moment in time, real or imagined, where the writer may have had to keep a secret, okay? So these are different options you could have used. Again, your own option as well will gain marks, don't panic. Uh, Use appropriate techniques for creative writing, as I mentioned before, vocabulary, imagery and language techniques. Use a voice that attempts to make the piece interesting and believable to the chosen audience, already mentioned, and demonstrate um, particular understanding of the form used and be written in a register and style appropriate for the chosen form. Okay, so again, using colloquial elements, dialogue or narrative or a sustained single voice in a monologue. Okay, so again, you might think, but I've not done any of those things. I mean, obviously you should have done language techniques and things like that. You might have, might feel like you haven't done those, but let's look through some examples and you will get a better idea of um, how the students have gained their marks, okay? Now, just so you know, to gain a level four and five, this is the main thing that we're looking at here, okay? So it's not so much what's on that section that I've just said, in case you're worrying that, you know, I haven't written it using that image or I haven't done this you know you do need to use language and structure you do need to have um, a good idea of your plan you know you need to use imagery good vocabulary things like that that I mentioned when we looked at what marks you gain okay and to get a level four you need to show that you've organized your material well okay to get a particular effect you've used the right tone or style or register Okay, have you done a nice plan to your writing and are you using a tone that is going to put your point across? What should what shouldn't you have done that you've done? What was the secret? You know, are you still keeping it? Are you going to tell the reader the secret in the end? You don't have to. okay. but as long as you've got an effective use of that tone of your style of writing, then you'll be absolutely fine. You manage your information ideas with structural and grammatical features used cohesively and deliberately across the text. Make sure you are using the language techniques and the structure that you've thought of. Are you starting from uh, one place, doing a flashback and then going back to the beginning? Okay. And to gain a level five, you need to do all of those things. But also, you know, you might want to uh, shape the audience's response subtly. So you might want to build up to what your final p- 
point will be or your final twist will be with sophisticated and sustained use of tone, style and register. Okay, you'll see what I mean by that in a minute when I do the examples. You can manipulate complex ideas utilizing a range of structural and grammatical features to support coherence and cohesion. Okay, so again, building up to your final your final reveal or using a flashback to to show something that might have happened okay all right let's do let's actually do an answer <laughs> uh so that's for ao5 sorry so that is for your your um your structure okay and then for your language which again is this one you need to use a wide selective vocabulary with only occasional spelling errors so try not to make too many spelling errors Position a range of punctuation for clarity, managing sentence structures for deliberate effect. Okay, managing sentence structures for deliberate effect. Are you going to build up to something that's happening at the end of that sentence? Are you using your little ellipses to maybe build tension or, you know, not quite reveal something immediately? And use extensive vocabulary strategically. Rare spelling errors do not detract from overall meaning. Okay, so very rare spelling errors. If you get too many spelling errors, you won't get a grade five. You punctuate your writing with accuracy to aid emphasis and precision using a range of sentence structures accurately and selectively to achieve particular effects. Okay, so this is all about language, this one. Sorry. Okay, so this bit's about language. So to gain your grade five, you need to make sure you're correctly punctuating your writing and uh, to aid emphasis and precision like i say you might want to use question marks exclamation marks you can use speech marks commas colons semicolons and if you can't remember to use all of those it's probably a good idea when you get into the exam to do a little jot down like this and it might remind you oh let's ask a question in there oh he's in shock at that let's use an exclamation point you know maybe he's saying what exclamation point at the end with speech marks in Okay, maybe he's going to shout something and you want to say, um, I don't know, uh, or, or you're trying to build up. So the only problem is, the only problem is, colon, I don't know her yet. Okay, so you're just, you're saying there's a problem and then you've told me the problem and that's when we can use a colon, something like that. Okay, semicolon here would be to like, you know, if you want to extend something, extend a sentence, maybe uh, that's not the only way that can be used. But uh, I don't want to go into too much detail. I will write, I will try and do a video on how to use colons and semicolons. But if you've got quite a long sentence or you've not quite finished your sentence, um, you can use a, a semicolon and then just finish it off. That sounds really, that's a really bad ex uh, description, but I will do a video on that, I promise. Okay, so... um. Again, it will help you to draw this little diagram and will help you to remember to use question marks, exclamation marks, uh, speech marks, commas, full stops correctly, colons and semicolons. Again, don't feel like you've got to use every single one of those, but it will give you more marks if you have used really good punctuation and grammar and vocabulary. Okay, finally, I've been saying this for ages, but I'm going to move on and actually look at some examples. This will be your most beneficial time looking at the examples and the examiner's reports. Okay, so let's do that now. So I've got two question five examples to look through and two question six examples. If you have done your, your answer, it, it's a really good time now to look through these ones and see how they compare to yours and think, huh, I could have done that. I could have put that in there. Okay. So let's go through and uh, see what they've got to say in their answers. Okay, so let's start on this one. It was beckoning to me, mumbling sweet invitations against my ear as its tender waves lapped against the shore. Don't go in, my mother had told me. It's too dangerous, she had said, squinting her eyes against the cold invasion of rain. I glanced over at her in the shelter, watching her chest rise and fall as sleep ribboned through her mind. The sky was grey, infected by grief and its cruel brother, sorrow. Yet the sea was pure, joyful and innocent, and just waiting for me to take its ruddy hand and slip into its embrace. I stood, 
the pebbles unforgiving against the soles of my feet, yet kind enough to allow my gentle path towards the shore. The water twisted around my toes and pressed soft kisses to my ankles, welcoming me. My jeans were sodden and, he and heavy against my legs as the water moved up to lick at the hem of my, sh my shirt. There was something foul on its breath, a noxious fume that seeped off of its tongue and only grew stronger with every other step I took. But it was kind, whispering its warm words as it slipped over my shoulders and embraced my tired neck. I gasped. Gone was the water's sweet affection, replaced by its cold fist lodged against my throat. Its sour tongue licked at each of my teeth, forcing its bitter taste into my mouth and choking me with its cruel affliction. It shoved its thumbs into my eyes as it screamed its vile cacophony into my ears and rang through my head, unforgiving. Nausea was growing in the pit of my stomach, tendrils of pain and misery uh, leaching out of the seed that I had planted there. A seed born from panic and stupidity. I opened my mouth to scream, yet the water muffled my begging with its cruel palm, which gripped my wrists as I beat them against its strong chest. Blackness seeped into my vision from the corner of my eye, pixelating into some sort of analogue screen as I felt my throat tense and then close up. Darkness had washed over me, trickling into my brain from the back of my eyes and pricking each thought with a burning pain. My legs were useless, hanging there cold and doughy as my arms made one last futile attempt to push off the water's vengeful grasp, yet it was to no avail. My finger twitched one last time as my arms sank and grew still. It twisted around me, dragging me down into its bitter depths with a cruel smile upon its sick face as it claimed its next victim. Okay, so this question was question five and it was to write about something that you shouldn't have done. So obviously, um, when I read the examiner's report in a second, you'll see, but he's saying his mother told him not to go in. Where is it? She said... It's too dangerous. Don't go in, my mother had told me. So that's the only link he's got to the question there. Okay, link to question. The rest is just explaining it and using language and structure very well to get to the end where, unfortunately, he, he dies. Okay, so it's quite... Um, it's not... You've not written about something I shouldn't have done and and gone back to that point over and over and over again... You know, you've just started, he's just started talking about something that he definitely shouldn't have done. And he linked it to the question very quickly at the beginning and that was it. Okay. So let's look at what the examiner's report says. This is an engaging and creative piece of writing that was awarded full marks for AO5 and AO6. So structure, okay, structure and language were very good. His structure was a simple beginning, middle and end simple structure but he used language really well okay and he used an extended metaphor throughout extended metaphor okay and his metaphor was the personification of the sea because the sea was constantly like a person grabbing him suffocating him things like that okay it is a response that draws its readers in and which shapes their response with subtlety, building to a powerful conclusion. Okay, so again, simple beginning, middle and end, but it was very powerful with the way he wrote it, with the way it was written. The candidate has sustained the style and tone throughout the response. The opening sentence is intriguing and the use of unpunctuated direct speech is the only direct reference to the question set, which I mentioned earlier. So it's unpunctuated because he hasn't used speech marks. He's just reminding he's just reminding himself of what she'd said. She wasn't actually saying it to him. She was asleep. This opening paragraph contains some interesting sentence variety and an ambitious vocabulary, such as the use of ribboned to describe her mother's sleep. The tone is foreshadowed through the reference to sorrow and grief, although at this stage the narrative is still relatively light and innocent. So at the beginning is just kind of thinking, oh, oh, sorry, she's just kind of thinking, oh, I'm just going to go into the sea, it's fine, you know. The personification of the sea is an extended metaphor, and as an adversary, it is, uh, is established from the opening sentence, it was beckoning to me. And this is cleverly sustained throughout the water's vengeful grasp. The end of the first page strengthens the, st 
the change in tone, but then pulls back with the alliterative use of warm words and the comforting embracing. Okay, so at first you're not too panicky, okay, because he's she's enjoying it. She's enjoying what's happening there. Uh, the reader is pulled up short by the abruptness of the short sentence at the start of the next paragraph. The graphic imagery of being violated is intensified by the deliberately chosen of shoved, sorry, the deliberate choice of shoved as a crude and violent choice of verb. The piece ends powerfully and with a well-controlled, complex sentence depicting the sea as predatory. Okay, so if we just go back a second. Okay, um cruel smile upon its sick face as it claimed its next victim okay as if it's a predator as if it's an animal that's just got some prey and and destroyed it killed it and eaten it okay there are a wide range of structural and grammatical features that support cohesion and coherence spelling is almost entirely accurate and writing is punctuated for effect and to aid emphasis and precision okay so writing is punctuated for effect there meaning that you know, they want you to feel a certain way. First of all, you feel panic because they're drowning. Um, and also the way that they've written it about the sea being a predator uh, just makes you feel very on edge. This is a powerful and disturbing piece of writing that sustains and builds throughout and which engages the reader throughout. Okay. So again, language is precise, good vocabulary, good grammar. Okay, not many spelling errors at all. It's spe spelling is more or less perfect. Okay, so this is a grade five. And um, because of all of those things being so good. Okay, it's awarded full marks for AO5 and AO6. You should use your experience. So this is a tip now from the examiner's report. You should use your experiences as a reader to inform your own writing. So basically, the reason I was saying to read lots of novels is because, and lots of um, fiction, is because it will help you with your own writing. Use the same techniques that you've seen other writers use within these books and, and short stories. Make those techniques your own by adapting them to your own purposes. So this was a really nice, well-written piece. Okay, I hope you're really starting to understand now what it is that you're being asked to do in the exam. So let's do uh, this next one. Um, I must apologise because it's a little bit difficult to read. So I will read it as best as I can um, and explain the examiner's report. Um, but let's just have a look at one more question five example. Sweat dripped off my face as I sat motionless at the traffic lights. I could feel my soul screaming out to me as I gripped the steering wheel harder. It hurt. It hurt a lot. All this pain for a bag of cash. I struggled up to my front door with my conscience dragging me back. I braced myself as I pulled the penetrated ball of metal from the delicate shatter of my right shoulder. The pain was nothing like I had experienced before. It felt as if I was cutting my nerves up into tiny little pieces as blood ran up to my ice-cold heart. Okay, so I think there... So here, he's he's... He's driving. And then here he's home, and I think he's taking a bullet out of his shoulder, by the sounds of it. Um, okay, that night I lay in bed, eyes j uh, jammed open or jarred open, waiting, waiting for them to come. Sorry, waiting, full stop, waiting for them to come. I could hear every siren across the city that night, every footstep of an insect which circled my house. I lay in my, my blood-stained bed. Suddenly... I, uh, a loud bang and entered my ears. I froze. My ice-cold heart expanded. It's the police, someone shouted out. Someone cried out as I rushed to my door. There's a few, he uses T double O too often. I could hear them coordinating through my house as I felt my earth, my earthquake-like tremoring footsteps pounding on the floorboards. We know you're here, Mr Wright. Just make this easy for, you, for us. The policeman called out. I could feel my dried sweat condensing on my face as I reached for my pistol. With my eye down the sights, I fixed on his sheriff's badge. Fire, he screamed as I stumbled to the floor with no control. Looking up in total oblivion, 
I felt the blood soak into the hairs on my legs, so they've obviously shot him there. Um, so then it moves on again here. Sir, this is a very serious crime you committed, said the judge, as the flowing current of tears running down my face increased. They, they were going to kill my mum unless I paid up, I replied. They are brutal men. I've seen their work, I proceeded. That's no reasoning for the attempted murder of the police officer and armed robbery, the judge replied. Okay, so that's that whole bit there. And then I think he moves on one more time. Here I lay in my orange overalls, covering up the the time monster that lies beneath them I am. The true monster, sorry. Here I lay in my orange overalls, covering up the true monster that lies beneath them I am, I think. Never to hear from my mum again played on my conscience for life. I still carry the tear I shed the day I was sentenced for my sentenced for my soul question mark okay it is suffocating in the bag of money which lay beneath the tiles on my patio. That one night of stupidity lost me everything. I even lost myself. Okay. Now even though it was a little bit tricky to read, maybe you read it better than I did. <laughs> These are the... This is called a grade four, which isn't bad. Okay, I thought it was quite good. Uh, because he does have structure. Like I mentioned, he, he starts in one section and then he moves on. And then he moves on. Okay, and then he moves on. And he keeps doing short paragraphs, doing different scenes. Which is fine, that's a structure. Okay. This is an answer that scores level four for both AO5 and AO6. The answer chooses to start um, in media res with a powerful and intriguing opening. Okay. So a very powerful opening meaning all you know, and all of this for a bag of cash. He, you know, sweat dripped off my face as I sat motionless in the traffic lights. I could feel my soul screaming out to me as I gripped the steering wheel harder. It hurt. It hurt a lot. All this pain for a bag of cash. First paragraph, straight the way, quite intriguing. You want to know what's going on. Um, you want to know what's going to happen next. The purposefully enigmatic introductory paragraph sets the scene with the use of short sentences and repetition for effect. It hurt. It hurt a lot, he says. A narrative hook is used. All this for a bag of cash. So, you know, he's, he's saying that to you and you're like, oh, let's read on. Let's see what happened. What did he do? There is an effective use of sentence variety through the intensifier of it hurt a lot is relatively simple and lacks the sophistication that one would expect for level five. OK, so again, rather than saying it hurt a lot, you could expand on that and say something a little bit more in depth with the pain and uh, describe the pain a little bit more. So for level five, you just want to, you know, up it a notch. The final paragraph on page one shows that this candidate has absorbed and can use the conventions of the thriller or spy novel with its frequent use of short sentences for effect and its paragraphing, which is effectively used to create quick edits from scene to scene within the narrative. So that was nice, those, those quick changes from scene to scene. A good structure there. The use of dialogue adds interest and shows a further use of conventions. Okay, so he's the use of dialogue, bringing in the police. The police are talking to him, you know. We're here, we know you're there, Mr. Wright, and so on. The third paragraph has a build-up of tension through description, and this is continued in the fourth paragraph with phrases such as earthquake-like, okay? So he, he does use a, um, a bit of a, a simile there, or even a metaphor, when he states... Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry. Um, yes, earthquake-like tremoring. So a simile. Um, as the footsteps pounding on the floorboards. Okay, so, you know, using a simile, that's quite nice. Sometimes this answer strives a little too hard for effect, such as in dried sweat condensing. Yeah, he had probably did try a little bit too hard there. <laughs> but never mind. A wide and selective vocabulary is used. He uses oblivion, motionless, penetrated. Punctuation is mostly reliable, although direct speech not punctuated properly. So make sure you are punctuating everything properly there. The answer ends strongly with a twist to the original question posed in the first paragraph. I even lost myself, which was quite nice. Comes to the end there. 
Spelling is mostly reliable, although two and conscience are spelled incorrectly throughout. So yeah, I did mention two. Make sure you're doing two, two and two correctly. Two, two and two. This is like two. I'm going to the shop. I'm going to the shop. That's the most common one. This one's the number two. And this one is like means also. Yeah. Um, I'm coming along too. I'm coming too. I'm coming as well. Okay. So just make sure you're using those correctly. The examiner's tip you may use ideas and techniques that you have met in your own writing, but you must make them own make them own and not simply plagiarize the work of others' writing. So for example, if he had read a spy novel, then maybe he was using things from there. I'm not sure why he's he said this one here, this tip here, but maybe that's what he's done. You may use ideas and techniques that you've met in your own writing. Okay. So again, similar to the tip mentioned before. Okay, let's move on to question six then and have a look at some of those answers. Okay, so finally, let's look at some examples for question six where you'd have to write about a secret. This example, they've done a little plan at the beginning, which is nice. They've put start with climax, interrogation, remembering particular events, Fixate on one object, diary of a close friend, list what was in there, subtly, outline fascination with those horrors, snap back to reality, conclude the same way as beginning. So this seems like a little bit of a plan that he might have, he or she might have drawn up beforehand and then linked it to the question. So let's have a look at what uh, they've written. I know nothing. The lights of the interrogation room aggressively pierced my eyes, blinding one to the point where the only thing I could see, uh, see was the inspector's even more aggressive glare. I sat there, chained to my own chair, showing no resistance, calmly waiting as the man in front of me furiously fired insults in my face. I do not care what he has to say to me. I will never tell him anything. I made this now before I was incarcerated before I was arrested, even before I heard the sirens wailing, proclaiming my ultimate defeat, as I had no choice but to remain in my apartment with no possible routes of escape available to me. Okay, very good start. All right, let's carry on. I will never tell him anything. He cannot know. No one can know. No one could understand what I have seen, the horrors that I partook in. Um the knowledge of, sorry, nor the incredible stories of such terrible atrocities, such indescribable abominations, the likes of which would make Eldritch himself tremble in fear. Okay, so there is just introduced a person. We don't know that person, but he obviously does, which is quite nice how he's done that. Who would have known that the madman was telling the truth? Question mark. Lovely. Even now, I can remember what happened decades ago. I myself was never an inspector, but I, yet I took it upon myself to investigate the case of Larson Kelsk, resident of St Germain Mental Asylum. His wonderful stories sent the ignorant into disbelief, yet I was astounded by his, te his teachings and tales of other dimensions, parallel universes, multi-spaces and their inhabitants. He's even used an ellipsis there, which is quite nice, a good example. So... I was astounded by his teachings and tales of other dimensions, parallel universes, multi-spaces, build tension with the ellipses there. Build tension. Okay, and their inhabitants. All right, that's nice. Any other person would have passed him off as an old man with a rich imagination and a few cards short of a, of a new deck. I think that's meant to say, I'm not sure. Of a deck, anyway. I was not such a person. He took an almost unexplainable liking to me, and every other week when I would visit him, he would tell me darker and darker, more sinister stories of his downward spiral into the realms of existence. I, naturally, was indoct indoct indoctrinated. Sorry, can't talk. One day, he feared for his own life and gave me the key to his vault in... Pestroika, I want to say. 
We shall meet in the place with the lights. So I think this is a made-up place, just so you know, that's, I think. Uh, but that's fine, you can do that. We shall meet in the place with the lights. And that's in speech marks. I never understood him, but once I read the library of books he himself had written and stored in his vault, I was perplexed. It all made absolute perfect sense. There was no question that that man spoke the truth. The paroxysm of my realisation rendered my sanity terribly strained, yet the strings of my mind hold tight. I hid from society, looking to come to an understanding of what I read, to no avail, of course. Sorry, I'm just struggling to read his handwriting. I was arrested on the 25th of June, 1979. I remained trapped in my mind. I know nothing. So again, speech marks there. All right, that was really good. Thinking about language, he's used some fantastic words there. He's also structured it in such a way that he starts with, he's being interrogated, I know nothing, being interrogated. Then he goes through explaining a little bit more about the story. Why is he being interrogated? Who he's met? And then it comes back to the end, I know nothing. Okay, so that's quite nice where it starts from one place and comes back to that place at the end. That's a very good structural technique. Okay, so let's have a look at the examiner's report and see what that says. This is a powerful piece of writing that shapes the audience response with subtlety. Okay, so he builds up. It begins with direct speech, which captures the reader from the start and which sets up an intriguing narrative, an interesting narrative hook that is returned to at the end, as I've just mentioned, producing a strong sense of textual cohesion, meaning he knew what he was going to write about. He's got an idea of how it's going to start, how it's going to end. There is a strong first-person voice used throughout and a sustained use of tone or style and register throughout. Okay, so he's used the same kind of tone. Okay, and he's used the same kind of style. So he's he's writing about something that he knows that, that no one else does and he's kept that nice secretive tone throughout that. The character of the narrator is purposely, purposefully devised to have a psychological complexity and intensity that is impressive when completed in exam condition as uh, exam condition as and in a limited time frame okay so yes very well done but then again he could have planned something like this beforehand and then used it and linked it to the question uh, the answer uses a wide and selective range of sentence structures with a complex sentence often deliberately followed by a short sentence for effect such as, I will never tell him anything. Okay, so quite a complex long sentence and then followed by a shorter one. The overall structure is well considered with a return to the arrest and declaration of non-cooperation and the narrative, the flashback, is well integrated. Okay, so he comes back to that beginning at the end. In terms of AO6, meaning in terms of your language, there is an extensive vocabulary used throughout, using the words interrogation, incarcerated, proclaiming, indoctrinated, paroxysm. There is a precision in punctuation used to create a subtle effect and a variety of tones. I naturally was indoctrinated. Okay, so he has got a really good understanding of vocabulary there. Okay, and you will gain that understanding of vocabulary the more that you read. Okay, read more. They can be novels, they can be short stories. Anything that you read will help you to be better at writing things like this. Okay, examiner's tip. You should know what you're going to write about and where your writing is going to end before you begin. In that way, you will build a greater sense of textual cohesion. Okay, so have a plan. Write a plan for your write for your piece, even if it's five minutes, um, like this student did. Okay, he might have also had a bit of a plan before he went in. Okay, but using good vocabulary, using that structure, you know, having a good idea of what you are going to write about and how you're going to write about it throughout is a very good idea. Don't forget, like I said before, use your senses, your five senses, you know. Uh, to describe things it will help in terms of what kind of language you're using okay and then so uh, this one sorry i think was a grade five 
let's have a look at this example. This is the last one, and then we're finished. <laughs> um, this one isn't so fantastic, but I thought I would show you this example so that you can see what's not great about it. You'll probably pick that out yourself as I'm reading it anyway. When I was little, there was always a secret. I only told my best friend. The secret got a bit old as I got older. Even my mum and dad didn't know or expect anything. Already there's some spelling errors in there. Best friend is two words, expect. And it's kind of quite a long... The first sentence is fairly long. There's not really too an intriguing entrance to it. But anyway... My secret is a bit disgusting, spelled incorrectly, for a little girl at the age of three to four, but I used to go to family resorts and any other kid would go play in the swimming pool or go eat ice creams. No, I was a different, I was a different, I decided I didn't want to play in the water with the other kids, I would rather go play in the mud with my bucket and collect frogs. So, <laughs> she's made a few spelling errors and it's such a long sentence, there's no clauses no full stops no semicolons it's too long too long way too long um you know and it's not really giving me any language techniques or um imagery really okay maybe she's put uh here no i was different i was a uh, different don't know what that means okay I decided I'd rather swim with the frogs and play with them at the age of three to four. Little girls, so that I think is a full stop there, which means capital letter. At the age of three to four, little girls would rather put dresses on, but there's me. There's as well. So there's me. I like to make sure my frogs can swim and I even made them a house. As I got older, I started growing out of the little phrase. I think she means phase. I went through and realised at the age of six, the mud was disgusting. My family thought I was going through a phase where I actually wanted to be a boy. I used to have this little notebook, but I used to call it my secret book. I used to write all my secrets in it. I don't think I ever told anyone else my secret about the frogs. Again, that's a long sentence. Uh, this is also a long sentence. Each paragraph seems to be one long sentence, which is very bad writing, unfortunately. Um, then she started a new sentence here using the word because, which is just not really done, and she's not used a capital letter. But because of the princess films about the princess kissing the frog to make a prince, I always thought it would end up becoming true. I've only ever kissed one. I quite liked that last little bit. I've only ever kissed one as like, maybe it's a joke. Um... It's, you know, intended to be funny. But anyway, so let's see what the examiner says here. This is a level two answer that demonstrates a straightforward use of tone and style with some awareness of the reader. So it's very, very basic. The opening sentence lacks the originality or stronger engagement that has been seen in the other student answers in this report. OK, so, yes, it's not really that intriguing. You're like, oh, that OK, but you're not dying to read on. It focuses clearly upon the question and sets up the idea of the secret which will be revealed, which is fine. It is explained in the second paragraph in a straightforward manner. There is an attempt to self-depreciation through the use of, but there's me. Some complication is added to the narrative through the introduction of the diary. The candidate is clearly making direct use of the picture stimulus from the examination paper at this point. So there was a diary image, I think, in the paper. You don't have to use that. Uh, however, the device of this secret book is undeveloped and the narrative itself is relatively simple and fairly brief. Okay, so it's too simple, too brief. They're not. She's not going into detail about anything. It is uncertain whether the ending is intended to be humorous, I've only ever kissed one, or is intended to be an allusion to fairy stories where frogs are kissed and traditionally turn into Prince Charmings. I think it is meant to be funny, but it's it's not, yeah. In terms of AO6, punctuation is used through, uh, sorry, punctuation is used, so this is your, your spelling punctuation in grammar, uh, is used though it is not always accurate or reliable and some sentences are lengthy, most. There is a range of simple vocabulary um, with fairly accurate spelling, but there are errors such as phase and disgusting that are spelled wrong on a regular basis. So not such a good example here. 
Just because you know something in your own head, do not assume that your reader knows and understands things in the same way that you do. So that's quite a good point to make there, the examiner tip. You know, yes, she obviously knows what she's talking about, but <laughs> she's not describing it in a way that lets the reader understand in detail. Think of your reader as an interested stranger that you may need to explain things to that you know very well, such as things about familiar people, my mum, or place, my school. Okay, so again, she needs to be a bit more descriptive. I think that's a really good way of explaining how you're going to get marks. Be descriptive, use imagery, use good vocab, try not to get spelling errors, um, and make sure you've got an interesting structure. Okay, I always like the twist at the end or flashbacks, flash forwards, but you can have a beginning, middle and end and still make it really, really interesting by using descriptions and imagery and good vocabulary. Okay, just like we saw in that one about the, the girl drowning in the sea. Okay, okay, so that was um, a fairly long video, but I really hope you have managed to understand what is being asked of you and where you are gaining marks. So hopefully you've understood what you need to do to answer the questions on the fictional writing paper, paper one, fiction and imaginative writing. You've learned some tips for answering these questions effectively and you've looked at example questions and answers as well as the mark scheme and assessment grids. So you should now be able to write a really good answer. It would be interesting to see some of your answers. If you did want to comment with some, then that would be nice. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's see what you've got there in terms of and maybe I could put some on my website if you've written some really good ones. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for using Cubit Education. And uh, I really hope to see you again soon. If you would like to follow us on our new Instagram account, it is Cubit Education. There's just a link just there. I'll put the link in the um, description as well. So there's our name. And you can also follow us on Facebook. And if you liked this video, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much, all from Cubit Education.